Right. You have to have people not laugh to bomb. And there was nobody there to not laugh. So in my mind, it was a success because I said the jokes out loud into a microphone. Live from the Willie Nelson and Friends Museum Showcase in Nashville, Tennessee. It's Music is Funny. Musicians talking to comedians about music and comedy. With your hosts, Raylan Nelson and Jonathan Bright. So smoking, I'm so hot, I keep talking, I'm drunk, but I'm still drinking too. Welcome back to Music is Funny. I'm Raylan Nelson. And I'm Jonathan Bright from the Raylan Nelson Band, back with another ridiculous and unnecessary intro. And a cough. Okay, so this is JB. Hey, JB. Hey, man. Nice to meet you. You guys are fast nice friends already. Yeah, we're, we're old friends now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't be afraid to be silly and funny, and don't censor yourself in any way. If you say something you don't want, we can take it out and fuck's my favorite word. So, you know, all right. It's okay I appreciate to, it. <laughs> it's okay to just be yourself, and you know, we're just trying to have a good time. I inevitably will say something that I regret. I'm <laughs> sure of that. I do every time. Okay, so what is the first music you remember loving as a kid? The first music that I remember loving as a kid. Okay, that's weird. Now, I've got a weird musical taste. I feel like I miss the best music and I miss the worst music, but I listen to everything in between. So the first thing that I actually remember loving was the soundtrack of Phantom of the Opera because my mom had it. <laughs> Playing it in the car, stuff like that. Yeah, she just had it. She'd have it on in the house. I'm home and I'm just remember those tunes. And I'm like this little turd walking around <laughs> singing show tunes. And that was the first music I remember thinking, well, it's the first music I learned to like sing out loud, I think. All right. It wasn't like a nursery <laughs> no, rhyme. Is that stupid? Is the podcast no. over now? Yeah, thanks for coming. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. No, we've heard it. We've heard stuff all over. Uh, yeah, I mean, raindrops rain... keep. That's the or one, yeah. Raindrops keep falling on my head. Was John Heffron? Sure. First. Yeah. Okay. Lots of Michael Jackson's. Uh... Yeah, lots of Michael Kiss. Lots of Kiss. I mean, so much Kiss. But... I would have heard Michael Jackson pretty early, and I remember my dad had a cassette tape that had Eastbound and Down on it, yeah. which. Until 10 years ago, I thought it was he's found a dime. <laughs> I thought this guy found a dime and he's like, put it in the truck. Let's go. <laughs> he's just like, this is a weird back. song. Got a dime, boys. Let's go, man. <laughs> <laughs> we made our money. Let's roll. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> I love that song. I always mess up lyrics. I thought my grandpa's song, um, Pon Poncho and Lefty, when it says, it's not even his song, it's Tom Van Zandt, which I just found out that my grandpa didn't even write this song. But I grew up listening to grandpa <laughs> sing it. And it, he says, um, all the federales say. And I thought he said, all the better mommies say. Could yes. Had him any day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We just discovered our sound pad over here. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, you got some you got some things there. Yeah. <laughs> <right>. Symbol. <laughs> we do have one of those, I think. Let's see. There it is. Thanks. Oh, you you knew where that was. You <laughs> pretended like you didn't have that one locked and loaded, but JB, <laughs> come on, man. Super producer over here. Okay, so um are you still listening to the Phantom of the Opera? Or like where did you go from there? Okay, so um I by the way. Still do like Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> and and but now I pass that down to my kids. They love listening to that. My youngest daughter will walk around singing memories from cats or like the greatest oh, cool. showman. They were really into that for a while. Yeah. How many kids do you have? Two? Three. Three. Two okay. boys and a little girl. Yeah. Oh, same here. And then how old are they? Eight, six, four. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You're in some fun times. Yeah. <laughs> Eight, six, and four. Um, so I went from show tunes to a, a big thing early on. I remember just listening to was uh, Weird Al. Okay. Uh, okay. Weird Al caught me at a young age, like a sleepover in maybe first grade. And somebody had one of those tapes. I was like, yeah. Was that also your first this. taste in comedy too, kind of? Or... Yeah, it might have been, you know, it, it was it was something that, you know, these songs that I had heard on the radio and enjoyed, but all of a sudden now this guy's making them funny. So we're all laughing. We're enjoying the music, but we're also laughing. So I thought that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And he's still cranking them out. Yeah. 
Weird Al's still killing it. Still making money. Yeah. We should have done joke songs. He should. <laughs> it's too late. I started doing that. <laughs> yeah. It, well, when you first start, we we just talked about this, but um, when you first start writing songs, I w or when I first started writing songs, I was writing funny ones because I was like, at least they would laugh, you know? Right. If they didn't like me singing and playing and like the song. At least they would laugh. But then it got kind of boring, you know, writing. As like a defense them. mechanism, you think? Yes. Yes. Because you had like the weight of the world on your shoulders, didn't you? The second you picked up an instrument, wasn't there this huge shadow? Well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah. I get people look at you and they go, well, all right, let's, let's, let's hear it. This is going to be magic. Well, yeah. But I'll be their favorite disappointment. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, though. When you start and everybody's I am like, their favorite disappointment. you've got, well, that's true too. <laughs> I'm not even really my favorite, but one of my favorite disappointments. <laughs> You're a disappointment. Yeah, Let's you're, you're in that. the top <laughs> Ten tier or somewhere. Yeah. But it was, when we started, people were like, well, it must be easy to get all the doors open with, you know, Willie Nelson's granddaughter. I was like, eh. I mean, you can get an email returned to you, but right. if you're Willie Nelson's granddaughter, you're also stepping into, like you said, you got the arms folded, like, all right, you're, you know, people are like, you're no Willie Nelson. Like, well, yeah, no fucking shit. I mean, of course. But right. if, if you suck, you'll suck. 10 times as much with the baggage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel like people have that with like with comedy? The second you stand on stage, nobody knows who you are, but there, there is this air of, all right, what do you got? Are you really funny? Do you feel that in music? Do you feel ever walking on stage? People are like, man, we'll see. In Nashville yes. all the time. <laughs> oh yeah. Music snobs in Nashville, huh? For sure. But oh, you yeah. were actually outside of play, you know, I've told everybody this for years. Like you play in Nashville, and you're like, oh, we're we're all right. And then as soon as you get 45 miles out, well, it's further now because of the sprawl. But say an hour away and start playing towns outside, you feel like a rock star because they're not used to. You. I mean, in Nashville, we are just lousy with talent. Everywhere you turn, somebody Every can play guitar. The they're playing music everywhere. Right. And everybody's great, and you get like we seek out bars that don't have music because we're so sick of seeing. Yeah uber talented people play you know so once you get outside yeah. you realize that we're really in a hotbed that they don't understand you know you could be marginal and get outside and people are like yeah so it's not quite you, you know i think with comedy if you go see a comedian you don't you can't just mildly entertain somebody and just let them chuckle like for the band you go oh, they're all right but you're something to watch or whatever with the comedian you almost have to nail it or people think you suck i just thought about this well there like, is oh. I know you're 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 right because I guess the difference is with comedy is people have to shut up in order to enjoy it and and be quiet. With music you can kind of enjoy that you can be like totally zoned in or it can be like an aside. Like you can have fun there but you're still talking to your friends like you're not Whoa, oh, I missed that. What did he what note did he play? Like right. the, you know, <laughs> you can enjoy the next musical note without having heard the previous one most right. often. You know, makes, yeah. whereas comedy, it has to you if you're not locked in, then you're not going to get it. You're not going to enjoy it. And so there's there's that extra little bit of thing that you're requiring of the audience, which is a bigger ask. Yeah, for sure. You, they must right? pay attention. I, yeah. I just did a show is so stupid. I just did a show up north uh, on Saturday and and before the show, they were not playing any music. It just people were walking into an empty room, just dead quiet. And I looked at the guy and I goes, Hey man, you should be playing some music like that at least gets people excited. And he goes, Well, we tried that a couple of weeks ago and people didn't really pay attention to it. I'm like, you know, that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. They, they don't have to be in there just like mosh pitting to the music. They could just be enjoying that as yeah. they're sitting there having a drink with their friend. That's hilarious. Like, he just totally didn't get it. And that is a weird feeling when I, even when we're playing, like uh, we played a, a benefit the other night and right when you get done and thank you, good night or whatever. And if the house music doesn't come up immediately, it was like, you know, <laughs> 45 second delay and everybody's just kind of standing around and we're like, oh, oh we're yeah. Done, uh, da, da. And this, it's, I don't know what uncomfortable silence. I never thought about it to just now. It yeah. is. You're just like, dude, come with the music. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah, you guys just rocked the house and now there's just silence and people are questioning their existence. <laughs> like, Did we just we have that? fun? <laughs> Why is it quiet? It's like they just like killed the music and flicked on the lights at the club and everybody's just got to scatter. 
So it, it also helps no. too to have music in the background in certain when you're hanging out with a friend talking because if it is silent, it is a little awkward, you know. So mm -hmm. it is kind of nice yeah. to have a little. It just changes the energy a little bit, you know. Yeah, it's, for sure. Yeah, even if you're not. Yeah, playing. I always have that in the background with my kids in case I got nothing to say yeah. to them. It's not awkward. <laughs> So back to music, when you get to like junior high and high school, did, were you, did you just listen to Phantom of the Opera, which would be hilarious? That's all I listened to all the way through. Because that'd be a tough <laughs> road to hoe as a young man. Like, <laughs> if I just owned it, yeah, just, just, just out, like wearing a half out. mask in high school, <laughs> just like, this is who I am, you guys. And a fro wig, <laughs> I, like a big owl. Handing out roses. <laughs> is a rose is involved? A, a picture of a rose. There is a rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been badass to be on like the football <laughs> team and wear the phantom mask. Like people always use that eye black and they like do to Design, but if I'm just out there just singing <laughs> and you're on defense, out, yes. <laughs> that'd be intimidating. You know, I think so. I should have. Oh, if I could go back, I would. Um, <laughs> no, I, I kind of just, I, I just gravitated toward all different types of music. Like growing up, I, I would listen to Phantom of the Opera. I grew up in uh, Nebraska, so I'd listen to a fair amount of country and, um, you know, rock and roll. And then, like, uh, Junior high, high school, I got into a little bit more like Metallica was really awesome. And then later high school, the kind of pop punk, like the Green Day and Blink-182, Newfound Glory, all those things like gravitated in. And I'm not sure that I've moved on from that. Yeah, I get it. You you get to that era and there's, <laughs> you know, the music reminds you of those times. It's tough to break out. I hear new great shit all the time. But if you hear one from the old days, it's like, yeah, yes. Yes, every song from the 80s sounds good. Right. It seems. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's so drastically different now, too. So did you try to sing at all or write songs when join a band, any of that when you were in junior high? Oh, high yeah. School? Oh, yeah. Let's have it. Oh, yeah. I bought a guitar in high school and I wanted to be I wanted to be the fourth member of Blink-182. That was who I wanted to be desperately. <laughs> so I was plucking out their little music. And then in college, I did join a couple of bands. We played one live show, three songs. End. What was the name of the band? We couldn't agree on that. That was part of the problem. <laughs> that was part of the problem. I still remember what we fought about too, because we couldn't. We didn't have. We had three songs, and we were playing one show. And I wanted to play all three songs, but one of them didn't have lyrics. One of them just had the music. I was like, let's just play it anyway. And uh, the drummer's like, we're not doing that. And um, the drummer and I did not see eye to eye. I wanted to call. You know, I was coming out of that pop punk thing. I wanted to call the band Chance just because i had an idea of the first album being just like a close-up of cleavage and calling it community chess and having this whole monopoly theme and i thought that would have been fun and uh but he wanted to call it something stupid like linder founding or i don't know what he drove past a sign one day that said that and that's what he wanted i was like that means nothing yeah means nothing our band name has to mean something chance means something <laughs> We're taking a risk here, man. This is art. <laughs> band names are so weird. We got a terrible band name. Yeah, we do. Uh, we can, but they're also kind of... Where'd you come up with it? <laughs> I don't know. It was her idea. <laughs> I just went with it. <laughs> it's, like, everything just seemed lame. You know, you could try to come up with... I mean, we, we thought of, what, 150,000 of them. Did we? I don't even and remember coming up were, with them. Yeah, but a lot of them were not real. Yeah, I can't say anything. I was in a, one of my bands was called Vajantis. We just made the word <laughs> up, but it sounds so incredibly offensive that, you know, my... Gr it sounds funny. Yeah, I, it was fu we thought I it was laughed funny. immediately. We thought it was hilarious. We didn't, had it, didn't somebody mispronounce uh, vaginitis or something? Yeah, and it came out Vajantis. But we even had shirts made with the old New York, I heart Vajantis, all that kind of stuff. It was It was funny. But I remember... Yeah, if you were playing songs like Green Jello or whatever their name is, Green yeah. Jelly, what was that band? Green... I think it was both, actually. I think they changed their I, Yeah. I, point. They're like P. Diddy. I think they had to go from Jello, Jello to Jelly Jello. because... Yeah. yeah, that's it. Copyright. Well, well, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Oh, no, I was just saying it was one of those band names that did literally meant nothing, but I can remember like my aunt and uncle would be like, so what you, well, I got a new band. Like, what's it called? I'd be like, well, we're in between band names, right? I couldn't even <laughs> say it to my family. It was hilarious. Sounds dirty. Yes, band names are Vajantis. stupid. Yeah. Do they know now? They all are. <laughs> yeah. They all are. Is there one that's not stupid? 
I don't know. Like it's that's the thing. If it's your name, at least if it's stupid, but it's your name, and there you go. It makes yeah. sense. It yeah. makes sense, right? Yeah. And nobody else is gonna get that confused with something else. So that but, makes sense. But like Beatles, that's stupid. It's kind of stupid. stupid. Yeah. It's Rolling stupid. Stones, Eagles, stupid. what are we doing? Yeah, the Eagles. What did you say? Like, Rolling what? Stones. Yeah. Rolling Stones. Get out of here. Who or cares? Boston. What's gonna... <laughs> Boston. Boston. Alabama. Boston, Chicago, <laughs> Alabama. Chicago. I mean, Kansas. <laughs> Leonard Skinner. Jesus, that there's a lot of cool. them. Leonard Skinner was named after their gym teachers. Yeah, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, but it's still a name named after somebody. That's true. I like The Who was not bad. Uh, but again, great band. <laughs> bad. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. If right, they're... right. It's hard to trash a good band name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the name of a band that uh, is good. The, right, right. So I guess we're all in agreement that Vajantas is probably the greatest band name of, of all, all time. time. Yeah. All right, we can move Say on. bring it back. I say bring it back. Raylan and the Vajantas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Raylan's Vajantas. Vajantas. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sitcom. <laughs> or a horror movie. Okay, so you're, are you, so you're still listening to that, old, uh, you know, like 90s rock stuff? Um. Yeah, I you know I, I must have a million like burn CDs that yeah. every song on there just brings back an instant memory. Um, now I listen mostly. Now I'll listen to music when I'm writing, and so now it's just classical because if there are lyrics, yeah. I'm no longer focused. Right. I was just about to ask. So can't study or anything. Listen to word or songs with words. Not a chance. No, you'll instantly be like. Even if you're not singing them, you're thinking them. Yep. And now you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So jazz or classical I'll listen to. And I don't know if I like it or not. I become familiar with it. Yeah. That's just like, something oh, to yeah. drown out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big fan of jazz at all, but I I understand that they're great musicians, you know, but I just don't like sure. the sporadicism of everything and nothing is consistent. It's like a sporadicism. I don't know. Is I that just a word? made that word up. It's right behind Vajantis. Yes. <laughs> sporadicism. <laughs> That's our new band name is Sporadicism. Like we've... <laughs> <laughs> the name of this, oh this episode, Vajantis Sporadicism. Oh, I'm just going to turn us completely different. So I what like was the it. first comedian okay. you remember loving? First comedian I remember loving for stand up would have been Bill Cosby, which <laughs> good man. <laughs> good Stop. man. Great yeah. lover. Uh hadn't heard much from yeah, him. Yeah. Has he been up to anything? I just got yeah. out of prison. Yeah. And, good. Hey man. Good for him. Well done. <laughs> I don't know how he got out. <clears throat> See, <throat> seemed like the <laughs> the evidence was stacked against him, but he's out. But um, yeah, I remember my sister got one of his albums and she didn't listen to it. She got it for like Christmas one year. I'm sure my parents didn't have any idea what to get us kids. And so they're just like <laughs> going to the mall, just like, all right, Bill Cosby, he's, he's America's dad. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let's get the, this guy gets a squirt gun. Yeah, it's, it's December. He's going to use a squirt gun. Outside. <laughs> um, and so she had that. And I just took that from her and just listened to it on repeat. So, you know, Bill Cosby was probably the first one, but it still seemed like it was this thing that a guy did. It didn't seem like a job. It didn't seem like something that you could grow up to be. It was just this bit of entertainment. It didn't seem fathomable to for, for, uh -oh. so, Vajanta go. said to me. <laughs> uh, or whatever. If you can't think of a word, just say Vajantis. <laughs> People won't question it. They'll be like, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the first time that I realized it was a job would have been watching Seinfeld on TV because that was his occupation yeah. in the show. And then you're like, wait, what? What does he do? He, he, do he tells jokes for a living. I was like, that's it. That's it. And I wrote that on a piece of paper. I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. I put it on, a, on my wall, and that was it. How old? Holy shit. I was probably a freshman or sophomore in high school. Wow. That's pretty early to go ahead and decide that's what I'm going to do. That was it. And I put it up. So my parents knew, knew the score. <laughs> They're like, oh, we're going to have to like financially that. support our son forever. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he'll grow up and be just like Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> Less drugs. <laughs> Less drugs. So what do you do? You Did Nebraska you write jokes in high school? Did you? Yes. Go do open mics yeah, in I, school? I did not I did not perform until after college, but I uh, I had been writing since high school. I tried to get up three different times. So in high school, I was gonna perform for a high school senior talent show. 
And I signed up. But the problem was, is I had, I didn't realize the days were conflicting and I had a golf tournament and I was gone. And I, apparently the, I was supposed to close the like, show and they announced my name. Like they didn't know I wasn't there. Like, and now stand up comedy, Nick Hoff. And I just dead silence. Like, okay, show's over. <laughs> I that guess might one, that may be the funniest bit I've ever heard. Yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> Did it on purpose. Nowhere near. I got back the next Monday. They're like, where were you? I was like, we didn't have cell phones on that day. I didn't have any idea what I was missing. Um, <laughs> so, how I much, so I had how much material did you have set for that talent show? Three minutes, five like, minutes? Or are we just going to go up and wing it? My thought was I had seven minutes written. Okay, that's a lot. But that's pause for laughter. Pretty sure there wouldn't have been a lot of that. <laughs> so maybe two and a half minutes I had written down. And it was mostly just impressions of like kids in our school or talking about, you know, things nobody else in the world could relate to, but just things high school specific. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain I was writing them in <laughs> Seinfeld's voice. What's the deal <laughs> with all this corn around? We, we talk about that all the time. Same way with music. When you first start writing songs, whoever your favorite is at the time, you just sound like them. A horrible invitation yeah. to your favorites. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, What did you sound like right away? Out the gate. Oh, God. The first songs I was starting to write, because I played drums first. When I first started writing songs, I'd probably pass that and got into the kind of the punk thing. The replacements, the clash, stuff yeah. like that. But uh you you were writing country country songs. Country stuff, yeah. Cause I just that was my background as country, you know. Sure. When I was growing up, my mom didn't let me listen to anything except for country, old country music and Christian gospel music. Oh yeah, we had a big talk when I was thirteen and I had to like, can I please listen to the pop station you know and she's like okay is that what you called it the pop station well i was gonna say 107.5 the river but you wouldn't know what that is <laughs> no but it's funny because my my wife was homeschooled until high school yeah and when she told me that in college where i met her uh i was like red flag dear yeah. god it's homeschooled oh no like religious household and she goes she saw it in my eyes. She goes, no, but we were, we weren't like a weird homeschool. Like we listened to secular music. And I was like, normal people call that music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> secular yeah. station. Yeah. Yeah. The delineation is made on the Christian part. Otherwise it's just music. Second red flag. Yes. Up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I married her. Red flags around. I, I still jumped into the water. Yeah. I was homeschooled a little bit. And, uh, yeah. I, there's some weirdo homeschool people. So yeah, you, I guess at you, 13, though, you got to listen to 107.5 The River, yeah, the secular station. I did that's when that demon Britney Spears took over, yeah, and insane, oh, uh, yeah, from uh, the yeah. music video, yep, yep, yep. I finally oh, got yeah. to live out my dreams, but, there you go. Um, but we're Your not mom shaking her head, <laughs> but enough about you. So, you're doing the so you missed the talent show. When's the next time? That's the talent show. Oh, yeah. So, then I went to school in Indiana. And they had a one-nighter there every week. And everybody and their dog that does comedy has been through this place on Monday night. It was called Bear's Place. It was this old like pizza place, but they had a back room where they had comedy every Monday night. And you'd see like Roseanne Barr's picture on the, the wall. She'd been through there, like Seinfeld, everybody, Sinbad, everybody had been through there because it's a Monday night gig, you know, in the middle of the country. At some point you drove through, you did this show. And um and so I called them up and I had been writing. So freshman year, I called them up. I was like, hey, I've been writing. I'd like, you know, do you, could I come do like five minutes? And they said, no. I said, okay. And <laughs> I, I forgot that that place existed. And then George Carlin came and he was, uh, there he is right there. He came uh, to do a show and I was a guest usher because you didn't get paid to do that. But if you sat people, then you got to stand in back and watch the show for free. Mm. Nice. And so I did that with all the shows, all the musicals. And then once a year we had a comedian. So he was coming in and I knew the general manager of the auditorium. And I said, Hey, I've got five minutes. You think I could go up before George? And he goes, what are you out of your mind? I'm not going to let you bomb in front of 2000 people for George Carlin. <laughs> and looking back, thank God I didn't. Cause it would have been devastating. All right. Does, so was, does George Carlin kind of look like Ringo? Mm, kind of in that picture. 
They all did in the 70s, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, you're right, you're right. So do you chalk up Isn't that asking to open for George Carlin to balls or just naivete? Naivete. It's because definitely a big uh, ask. What the fuck does that mean? What are y'all saying? Yeah, vajugular or whatever. What are we saying? Vaginas? <laughs> yeah. What is it? Vaginas. Vaginas. <laughs> vaginas. <laughs> you just call yeah, it was... vaginas now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just say vagina. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just say vagina. No, but it's like if, you know, if I was just starting in a band and the Rolling Stones came through and I went to the guy going, hey, you mind if I go up and play a few oh. notes? <laughs> So are you naive enough to think no, that you, that's not a no, weird you thing? Guys, or do you I check my grandpa's fan email. There are people who do that. Oh, yeah. but They send sure. email like, hey, I want to. No, but the question is, is, is it because they have balls the size of Texas or they just don't know any better? Yeah, yeah. That may, may, mm, it's not both. balls. Like both, too, maybe? A little bit it, of both? It's, like they don't know how it works? <laughs> so to, I think any time to get into the entertainment business, whether you're playing music or telling jokes, there has to be a little bit of like you don't care about the consequences or they don't resonate with you. And to me, that's not having balls. Like people always say, oh boy, it takes a lot of guts to get up there and do what you, it doesn't. There's that, that's the piece in my brain that makes me stupid. Like some people are stupid because they can yeah. climb the side of a building and they don't get scared of falling off. That's the thing in their brain that makes them stupid. I don't think that's balls. I think that's just a disconnect in the old bean. And that's what I have, and that's what I'm sure you guys have to get up there on stage and say, "Everybody, listen to me. I'm <laughs> I've got something worthwhile up here." Yeah. And know. and in the beginning, that's stupidity. That's a great way to put it too. It is because you have to be insane to try and do it in the first place. We say it all the time. I'll say it again. Statistically impossible to make it in our chosen field, basically. Absolutely. <laughs> so you have to just be Absolutely. able to hear no and then go, well, this guy clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. Fuck you. I'm going to go over here and keep doing it because I'm a genius and you just don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. If you have that belief and desire and the love, then you'll continue with it. But so many people try. Like I tried music. One show, done. End of career. <laughs> I, I didn't have the thing that you guys have to go do that. I had it with comedy. I didn't have it with music. Yeah, it's a trip. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you're in Indiana doing shows, right? At this time? No, no, no. I hadn't. I hadn't done it. So I had tried to get on those two times in college. Okay. Um, and but I knew in the back of my head, I always knew this is Plan A. I'm going to college. This college is my backup plan. Like just to appease my parents or whatever, I have to like make sure that I set, set the dice that I, you know, will live right. if comedy doesn't work. But in my mind, it's comedy. So then upon graduation, it was either New York or LA. And uh, I figured Los Angeles had better weather. So I came out here to do stand-up comedy, just got a know-nothing job and started doing stand-up a few months after moving out here. Where? Just wherever you could? Yep. Uh, out here, you know, it's like Nashville with comedy uh, or with music. It's like, you know, every dive bar has an open mic night or a booked comedy night. There are comedy clubs that have their own, you know, sign up, go up, that type of thing. So any given night of the week, there are 30 or 40 different places here you could get up. And you might only have two audience members and they might both be comics waiting for their turn. Right. But you have opportunities to get up and try. And so that's what you do. And you make a couple of friends and then all of a sudden there's strength in numbers and we're going to open mics together, driving down to Long Beach, all like working on this and on the drive back. Was that funny? What did you think about that? Oh, maybe if you try this. And so you're helping each other a little bit, yeah. which stand up's very solitary. Like you're up there alone. Mm -hmm. It's very much singles tennis, but then like it's good to have those friendships where you can just bounce things off of people, which I feel like would be really hard with music, but that's why you have bandmates, right? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I get jealous of you guys because you just just you, you know. You don't have to pay a band to come with you. You don't have to worry about everyone eating when they need to eat and getting hotel overheads low. Everyone. And yes, it's just you just need a microphone, and you don't even <laughs> need that if there's only two people in the audience. It's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. true. So often I could just yell at them. Yeah, well, but we've we've definitely done our fair share of shows where we're just singing, playing for two people, playing for yeah, to, or none. No, remember that Laverne show, and it was just the the guy who the booked staff. us. Yeah, and the staff. Yeah, that was it. I mean, and you still got to do it though. Yeah. When they pay you a guarantee, I'm like, this didn't seem like they're promoting this at all. And you show up, like, there's literally nobody here. I'm like, do we have to unload? And like, it's part of the deal. I'm like, all right, here we go. 
Yeah. Have you ever done comedy for nobody? (laughs) So the first show I ever did, I say was for nobody. Now, the reality is there was a cook that I could kind of see if I leaned forward through that little window where he'd set the food. There was a guy back there. There was no... The guy that booked it, uh, he went up and he was the host. And it was the first show I ever did. It was at the Otis College of Art and Design in their cafeteria. Nobody's eating at this time. It's like 8 p.m. at night. Nobody's in there. And uh, and the host goes up, brings the other comic on. He goes up, does his set. And then that comic had another show, so he left. Now it's just me and the host. And the host brought me up and then went outside and made a phone call. So now I am in there alone with my brand new jokes. First time ever. I'm trying to talk to the cook and then every once in a while a kid with a backpack would walk past i'd be like hey guys you ever you ever you, what do you think about sharks <laughs> <laughs> you ever go to the ocean you know trying to interact but for me it was good because it wasn't a bomb right. you have to have people not laugh to bomb and there was nobody there to not laugh so in my mind it was a success because i said the jokes out loud into a microphone that's nice did the cook chuckle at all I mean, I couldn't tell if he was smiling or just like, like get out of here. We're trying to close. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> My it's biggest fan. Weird. Why would they make you do it if nobody is there? I guess the idea is maybe people will show up. If they see something happening, maybe they'll go in. But if they see something happening, the and thought was watching. By the way, colleges still pay, they still pay good money. Right and here. half the time, that is the show. They set you up in the cafeteria. Half the time, there's not a microphone. They don't even realize you don't have to have a microphone. And they'll just set you up in there. It'll be like 2.30 in the afternoon. And maybe you get a couple snackers. Like most of those shows are garbage, but they had to set up something. Somebody at the you know enrichment program or whatever it is at the college had to book something. They had a budget and they had to do. And so they put comedy in a horrible environment and that's what it is. So it still is that way. I wasn't getting paid for this show. This was, you know, a glorified open mic, but that's still how a lot of college shows are that aren't like the bigger names coming in to do the theater. And it's wild. But the money's always decent. That's why people do it. Well, these colleges, they have, you know, kids tuition is crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And so they have the money and they're like, well, we got to do something. Yeah. I should should get in there and get that. You should start doing doing your stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Got like three minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Three minutes. You you do that. Then who's from out of town? So (laughs) if you're doing, and it seems like if you're in uh, Los Angeles or New York, when you're doing comedy, you don't necessarily have to get out and tour outside of California. There's plenty of places to work and you can sort of build your career in one of those two spots if you're in one of those two spots but did you get out and hit the road much at all early on so i started in 2005 at the end of 2005 and my first paid gig in los angeles was probably 2007 2008 um where you got some money to host at one of the clubs here but it wasn't great money. And that's the that's the thing that's weird is you can't make money in stand-up in Los Angeles, really. It's like Nashville. Unless, yeah. Because, yeah, there's an embarrassment of riches when it comes to talent. And people have to, you know, play. They have to do comedy to work on their stuff. So the biggest names in comedy are willing to do it for free. What are the mid guys going to say? What are the low guys going to say? And so the clubs out here are called showcase clubs. And like one of the best ones out here, it pays $17 a set. So if you do both shows that night for sold out crowds, you made $34 and they charge you half price for a hamburger. (laughs) And, and I mean, you look at the, you look at the lineups and that's the best names in comedy night after night, but that's just what that is. And they call it a showcase. They're like, well, you know, somebody from NBC might see you. Right. Here you go. Um, Which there is a little bit of truth to that. I got my first commercial agent because they saw me there. Okay. And so there's a little bit of truth to that, but you have to tour to make money. New York's a little different. In New York, you can get, you know, five, six sets a night and each one pays, like a weekend set pays a hundred bucks. So you can make 600 bucks in a night there. You know, as long as you're filled, you're doing okay. Right. You're yeah. making a living. But Los Angeles, so you, yeah, you can't. You were doing stand-up and 
there was a commercial agent in the crowd and he's like, Hey, you're funny. You, you have a face. No, they, I don't think they cared if I was funny with commercials. It's all just like your look. And I have a very like neighbor Nick type look. Like I look like, yeah, everybody knows somebody like me, just a generic yeah. white guy with a face. <laughs> and I, I checked both those boxes and somebody said, I could sell that face. And so I got there and it, it worked. Had you ever gone on a, any it, auditions or anything like that before you got this commercial agent? Or was that a brand new? Nope. Yeah, was that your plan? Nope. Was your plan? Like, oh, no commercials. No, no, I had no idea. Like I had never done an audition before. And in fact, when I got the card, I like called somebody that I knew that was familiar with that world. And I was like, is this the thing? They're like, yeah, call them. And so I did. And I started going on auditions and it wasn't too long before all of a sudden I'm doing TV commercials, which was super easy money. Yeah. It's super easy. Like really, you all, most of them, you have to do nothing. You just have to look like who they envisioned. Right, right. What did you, what do you, how was the audition? That uh, the whole audition process just sounds horrifying. Sucks, especially for commercials because it's a cattle call. The first audition, there'll be a hundred people that look just like you. I was just about to say, <laughs> is there a waiting room with just a bunch of dudes that look just like you? That sounds That's fun. when you realize that you hate yourself. <laughs> 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 when you're looking around, you're like, I would punch every single one of these people in the God, nose. You're like, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you go in, you start to see a lot of the same people at audition after audition because they're in your category. Right. And then sometimes you go out for an audition and nobody looks like you. And then you go, what the hell's going on? I did like a Volvo audition and I was the only white person there. Everybody else was Hispanic. And it said, this is for Latin markets. And I went in to the callback now. Callback, maybe there's 20 people there. These are their favorites. Still, it's just me and 19 <laughs> people that look nothing <laughs> like me. And I walk in and I did it. And I go, okay, thank you very much. And I stopped and I go, can I ask you guys something? What's happening? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> and they get, the guy looks at me and goes, oh, you're our white option. <laughs> the, the client requires that we have a white option for them. And you guys all look alike to us, so you'll do. You're the guy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Didn't get it. Wow. <laughs> they went with the other way. <laughs> <laughs> they went with what they thought they wanted. <clears throat> okay, cool. So you didn't, you've never done, did you have any designs when you went to Los Angeles? Because I know a lot of people are like, well, I'll parlay this comedy thing into, maybe not so much anymore, but that seems like the old school way. Hit Los Angeles, do a little comedy, be discovered, and then get on TV or Sitcom. sitcoms, movies. Did you have that in the back of your mind at all when you went out there? No, but that is like a uh, that's like a cheat code, right? That you see helps your stand up career. And I, I very much thought that was a possibility. Like I was open to that possibility, but not for, you know, acting wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to do stand up. So I was like very much into, though, if you get on a TV show, all of a sudden everybody knows your name. You sell tickets on the road. Now you work and you make way more money doing the thing you wanted to do. So Seinfeld was very much the formula for doing that. Like him, Tim Allen, uh, Kevin James did it, although a little bit later. Um, all these guys, you know, now all of a sudden they're playing theaters. They're making so much more money than they ever were, you know, just going around doing the clubs. So I looked at that. I was like, well, yeah, if, if I can put, you know, the cheat code in and get, you know, all of a sudden now I'm selling tickets. I got all these fans then I'm open to that. But stand-up is what I love. Even the few acting gigs I've done, there's no audience there, so there's no instant gratification, which I'm addicted to. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably didn't get a bump from your commercials or anything, people going, oh, that's the guy that's in... No, it just it was just a little more financial security to get yeah. like all of a sudden this mailbox money. I mean, it's fun to be on set, and I get to work with some cool directors... Um, that I was a fan of that made comedy movies, but um, no, there's no nobody goes, Aren't you the guy from the Miller Lite commercial? Oh, yeah, we got to see that guy live. Yeah, <laughs> he said three words on my TV once, right? No, there's no cachet with that. How'd you get involved with the radio show? Or the okay, know, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. so uh, for people that don't know, I co-host the Sirius XM show with Larry the Cable Guy on uh, his comedy roundup station. So I was, through my manager, I was pitching a show. They were looking for more content on that channel. They were looking for like weekly shows that they could put on the channel. So they were asking some comedians to come up with ideas. And through my manager, I was pitching some ideas. And it was at the exact same time that he and Foxworthy were were uh, putting together their nationwide tour. And my manager just happened to say, like, if you need an opener, how about Nick? He, he'd be good. And so they booked me for uh, two shows. They booked me for two days. They had like 75 cities they were going to. They booked me for two of them. And I did those two shows. And then they said, okay, he's the guy. And I did all 75 of them. So I opened for him and Jeff back in 2016, 2017. And now I still open for him on the road. And so then a few years ago, he's like, "Ah, just do my show with me every week. So now we we get to have fun on the radio once a week. Yeah. We're serious. So that's cool. It's always nice having a steady gig, even, but not having it as your only gig, you know, like a weekly radio show or whatever, just as musicians comics whatever it's you know wild west you're going out booking things nothing's ever regular but when you land on something that you can count on that doesn't take up all your time it must be very very nice yeah and it's just something on the calendar that you didn't have to put there and now it keeps you it keeps you active it keeps you doing it because i don't know if you guys feel this way at any point i can quit comedy yeah like really my career only go like i my next, my last show booked right now, I think is March 25th. So whatever that is, six months out. But after that show, if I don't continue booking, I just don't do comedy anymore. Right. Like, and so it's kind of, right? Like if you don't put, continue to put things on the calendar, you just retire and nobody, like, That's nobody nice. sits there and goes, why is he not showing up to work? Well, you didn't have work to do. And so it's nice to have something that's there every week that just keeps you going and keeps the juices flowing and like right. keeps you working, really. Yeah. That's true. That's why we started doing this during the uh, pandemic because we couldn't play or do anything. And we, yeah. we, we were like, you know what? Who else can't do anything? There's comics. Maybe we can sucker them into getting on here and talking to us and just talk to some of the people we listen to in the van when we're driving around because we don't ever listen to music because we can't agree on it. So we just listen to comedy podcasts or comedy specials. Yeah. And, and I, honestly, I, I love that from music the when I'm by myself either. I listen to comedy. I listen yeah, to I podcasts. Me too, pretty much. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Now people are getting more in tune with the process of comedy more than ever. I, and does music have that? Does music have that? Like, are people really invested in the behind the scenes type? Like, unless you're like the super fan of that band. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think the casual listener really cares about how. I mean, they might watch it, you know, again, what you're saying. If you're a huge Willie Nelson fan, here's a behind the scenes. They like watching them do their thing, but they're not going, oh, interesting how they mix things together and how they write. I don't think. People really care unless you're a musician yourself. They don't really care about record production or who produced this yeah. or that'd what, be boring. What's I would not go on. on I wonder though. I I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's true. I wonder if people. I wonder if maybe just it's harder to convey. Like a comedy podcast, you can you can talk about it and then still be funny, and there's entertainment there. Whereas you're for forte is music, so you got to find a way to integrate that into what you know, they're yeah. listening to like, I don't know, a stupid idea would be actually playing music while, while you're doing it or experimenting like as you go, but maybe that's a little too personal for well, you guys. Then again, I mean, not on a, a wide level, but they used to have all those VH1 shows or whatever it was behind, not behind the music. That was the gossip stuff, but behind, they would pick a classic record and they would put a producer in there behind the board and he would tell stories and pull faders down and just play. Here's just the vocals. Here's the guitar. Here's yeah. just the solo drum track. And those did well. Those were, we cool. did talk about <clears throat> recording us doing, uh, writing a song, you know, like co-writing a song, filming it. Yeah. But honestly, if we put that out, we would just get canceled. And it wouldn't be genuine <laughs> because when we write songs, we do it. He's at his house. I'm at my house. And it's a voice memo that we're sending back and forth and, or lyrics and a shared note. We're not. And honestly, when we get together, if we're just hammering out an arrangement or whatever, and we're, we're stuck on maybe we need a new, uh, 
section for this verse. Let's come up with a line or something. It's a lot of this. Then, it, yeah, it's five minutes of us just with slack jawed, staring off into space in our own, you know, we don't right. Talk. So it wouldn't be it's very like you interesting. Writing a, like you writing a joke by yourself and sitting around and thinking of it and then writing it down. It wouldn't be, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I hate to be a naysayer, but I'm, I feel like I'm being encouraging here because I, I think. I think that people might be intrigued by that. Yeah, you can't sit there, you know, just with your finger on your on your mouth for 17 minutes. But a couple of times I have gone live on like Facebook or Instagram and I'm like, hey, I'm going to take five minutes worth of suggestions for uh, a joke and then I'm going to write it and I'm going to take a half hour and I'm going to write it. And some of that is me just kind of thinking out loud to myself, just kind of looking down, like tapping a pen and then... Oh, that's stupid. But what about this? And just like playing the snares. And I've had multiple people say that was better than anything you've ever done. <laughs> Which is, I don't think they've quite said it like that. But one, a couple of people said, I couldn't look away. That was really interesting to see how your brain was working. And I would be interested to see how musicians' brains work. Now, it's intimate. It's and embarrassing yeah, to let yeah, people into that. And maybe that's why. We'd almost have to censor it's, ourselves too, because yeah, we start coming up with canceled. joke lines that are horrifically offensive. You have to get the offensive. dumb shit out. You have to get the dumb, stupid shit sure, out. Sure, yeah, yeah. To find the real yeah. thing. Uh, I think well, you guys could do it. Bad. Well, uh, do yeah. one that's produced. Do one that's produced. Like record an hour of of it, and then just knock it down to five minutes, so it's just yeah, the meat, and potatoes. Yeah. Then, then it'd be funny if people were like, "I love how I'm giving you work." <laughs> I really love the. I can see people coming and going. Man, I love the process. I hate the song. Finished product. <laughs> really loved watching you guys. Song is dog movie. shit. Yeah, but I hate your song. Well, we could do it on because <laughs> we haven't written the newest, newest one I came up with. So we could do it with that one because there's literally no lyrics or anything. It's just a melody that's and true. some chords. All right. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to film everything. <laughs> everything. Uh, you just continually have a camera running. I hate it now, but I record every set with my camera just in case. You it's don't fun. know. Yeah. Yeah. I would hate. I would hate to get attacked on stage and not have the footage. Daddy right. needs content. Yes. Let's always be recording. Just leave it going. Okay, so when um, we're running up on an hour, so I want to make sure I ask you about my okay. grandpa. When's the last, or when's the first time, <laughs> or the last time? I don't care. The first time you remember hearing about my grandpa. When my grandpa's Willie Nelson. Uh, yep. Uh, um, the fr well, the one that I. It would have been his song, uh, uh, Always On My Mind. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yep. I got that right, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been his... I don't remember how old I was, but I remember listening to it, and it's a distinct thing because his voice isn't what you typically would hear on the radio, right? It's not Phantom of the Opera, that's for sure. It's not. He was wearing no mask. I was very <laughs> confused. What is happening right now? But it was this love song, and you hear like the little, you know, the interesting, like, uh, it wasn't vibrato, but it was like uh, it almost is. like an honesty, like the shaking of his voice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Would vibrato. you have? Would you say that's a vibrato? Yeah. I with would. him specifically? With him specifically? On certain I it's know what you're his, talking about. And it's his style. His certain... version of vibrato. Probably going for yeah. it. Yeah. He's just got that kind of voice that just is weird. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a weird voice and it's great. That's what makes sense. Yes. Yeah. That's why that's, he stands out because yeah. he has a distinct voice. I'm not saying weird's a bad thing. It's a great thing. Why do you hate my grandpa? Right, voice? right. I'm just kidding. I like his voice. I just don't think he writes very good songs. <laughs> this trash talking Willie right here on Froggy 107.5. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that that song would have been my first introduction to him. Um, and then he's he's kind of like he's kind of like a penny in that he seems to have always existed. Right? I can't pinpoint <laughs> the moment that he like I was aware of him, but he seems to be the guy that was always around. And was he in was he in half baked? Yep. Yeah. 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 And so then when you see him, like you're like, yeah, there he is. There he is, that guy that's always been there. <laughs> now he's yeah. high Doesn't he feel that way? It, it does. And what's that? There's been multiple people that have said that. It's like, I don't know. He's just seemed like he was always there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's like Elvis. It, he's, 
Yeah, yeah he's like immortal in because that way. He's older than all three of us. He has so. always he has been around always technically been since we've been alive. So that's a good point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, it, it seemed like it, it seemed like he was this category of his own where he was just, I, I don't know. I guess I would have put him in the country music category, but he seemed like this, like here's country music. The, the people that I would have heard growing up in Nebraska, the, uh, you know, the, the Garth Brooks and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden here's Willie and he's in this like thing of his own. It's, it's yeah. the yeah. country bro, but it's this other thing. Country and, and Western um, music. That, you know, well, they also country music kind of tossed him out of Nashville anyway. Yeah. He, he left here. He didn't make it big until. He Hold got on a there. second. What are you talking about right now? I don't know this. He was right. He got tossed. Which, he was banging around Nashville and writing songs and doing all this. And they were like, we love your songs, but we don't want you singing them. In the seven, early 70s. So he ends up, oh God, the guy's name's forgetting me, but uh, a New York label and this Wexler, Jerry Wexler, I think, yeah, brought him right. up and heard him. And while Nashville wouldn't let him sing and just want him to write songs, he took him up and he's like, you do... Whatever you Just want. go in and do your... I think they did a gospel record first, and they had some time left over, and he recorded Red-Headed Stranger in the leftover time, and they just let him do his thing. So, But he had to go to New York to be allowed to do his thing. They wouldn't let him do it here. They are just like, yeah, keep writing wow. songs, but we don't want to hear you sing or play. <clears throat> and he lived here at the time, and then moved to Texas, and grew his hair out, and just started being more himself, because here in Nashville, they want him to wear suits and be all, you know... Clean. Yeah. And, and he didn't make it till he was, what, 43 or something? It was 1975. He was 44, 42. He was born okay, in 33, wow. and he made it in 75 or 73. So while he had success as a songwriter, he heard plenty of no's on the way up, too, all the way until yeah. his mid-40s. Now, he also yeah. had some amazing songs when Patty Klein, Patsy Klein did his song. You yeah. know, he had hits with other people. I mean, but. he did the songwriter thing like everyone in Nashville, you know, hanging out at the Tootsies where all the Ryman stars were hanging out so he could uh -huh. put songs, you know, that was... they just catch him at the bar after the opera. They'd go to the back door, led right into this bar, and they would go drink, and then the songwriters would hang out and drink with him and go, hey, you got anything new? And pass him songs. That's why we don't go there. <clears throat> we don't want them to pitch us songs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Quite the same. Are anymore. there still people? No, something like that. No? Not there. I, I, did he resent writing other people's songs? No, I don't I think, think he so. just wanted to do his own things. Like, I, I, I'm making money doing this, but I want to make a record too. Why can't I do that? And somebody right. made do it. So I'm sure he was like, sure, I'll make a record. It's not going to cost me anything. And then it goes, you know, read it at a stranger, and then it defines a whole new genre almost. And mm -hmm. well, and then there's like uh, Hello Walls, where he wrote that one, and he put out a version of Hello Walls. But yeah. uh, Farron Young is the one who made it big. And uh, they, there's a cool story about that because they were writing the song together, and um, Farron went to go to the bathroom and got a phone call or something, comes back, and Papa Willie had written the song. And really, yeah, like they had started it, they had started Hello Walls, you know, and Farron had to go to the bathroom or had to take a phone call, and then, <laughs> but like they say in Nashville, in for a word, in for a third. Yeah, so there's yeah. a co write there. <laughs> 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 There's a huge fight right now. I, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but there's oh, a huge please. fight with comedy in that third right now. Oh, yeah? Oh. Because up till now, comedians weren't being paid for the third. Right. Oh. It was just halves. And then somebody a year ago said, hey, what about that third that songwriters get? And some comedians said, yeah, that's true. We write the jokes. And now there's a huge hullabaloo. Mm, There's a hoopla. I can see why, though. <laughs> There's a vajantis. <laughs> There's a this huge vajantis that's just <laughs> overshadowing the entire comedy community. <laughs> it really stinks. Oh, man. Well, I bet I could probably get in for a third on some of those comedy ones. You? That's, yeah. How? I'll sneak my way in somehow. All right, well, There's a third a now? There's a third now. Right. <laughs> Weasel in. Weasel yeah. in on that third. Weasel in. Yeah, you should go to the female comics. They seem very welcoming to other females, you know, the sisterhood. Yeah, they do. <laughs> anyway, we Got should issues. probably get out on that. Yeah, let's stop talking about that Loose lips now. here. Oh. <laughs> Vajantas. Vajantas. Hey, thanks for doing this with us. You're yeah. awesome, man. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for great. having me. What I'm sorry to disappoint you guys with my <laughs> with my musical taste. Oh, no, that's the best. It's this always great when it's <laughs> left of center. A great episode. Uh, what do you have to promote right now? What do you, what you're, what's your um, 
Yeah, I'm constantly on tour, so nickhoff.com for all those dates. Uh, but I did release a uh, special out on YouTube two months ago. It's called Nick Hoff Front to Back. It's free to watch. And so check that out and uh, subscribe to my channel, leave comments, all that good stuff. That that helps. I'd be interested to know what people think about it. All right, cool. Awesome. Man. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, you guys. Nick Hoff is my favorite comedian. But Johnson's. Enjoy your groceries. I know your mom's name. Don't be an asshole. Do we cheers yet? Enjoy your cigarette.